Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Our Small Footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off-grid in Australia, though the background at the moment doesn't lend to that. So I am in Brisbane at the moment to do my eight weekly grocery shop. Uh, I also had a medical appointment while I was down here, so I end up having to stay an extra day. I've got to go and get an MRI. So I'm going to be here an extra day. So I've got a little bit of uh, time up my sleeve while I'm here, which is kind of nice and kind of hard too. Uh, so I'm trying to get some videos that I have some footage for done and uploaded while I'm here. May as well use mum's high speed internet and get it done. So I have a video for sourdough focaccia. Now, a lot of my sourdough I make really simply. I like to do overnight rises and things like that and not too much effort, but I have been experimenting with a few different things lately on trying to improve the texture of some of my breads uh, purely because I want to. Uh, my All my sourdough is perfectly edible. We do a lot of flatbreads, we do a lot of bagels, we do a lot of boules, we just, and it's all, it's all great. I've got perfect routines down on it. Uh, but focaccia was something that I had struggled a little bit with and I think part of it was that I wasn't letting it prove enough. So focaccia you want to really significantly almost overproof. It's a sort of a, a loose dough and you want it to be really, really bubbly, like far more bubbly than you would for most loaves. Uh, I saw a couple of YouTube videos, uh, I think there were reels actually on Instagram and maybe some TikToks or something of all these different methods of making focaccia and timings and things like that. So I decided to give it a go and adapt it for me. Now it's a bit more hands-on than most of my bread. Most of the stuff I really like to do like late at night, leave it on the bench and then sort it out in the morning. We are having issues with the bush rats again at the moment though. So leaving things on the bench becomes an issue because they will eat through the uh, plastic covering or beeswax covering or whatever covering you've got on your dough uh, to get to the dough underneath, which is great. So we're having to bring it inside, which requires more adaptation because inside is five or six degrees warmer than out on the kitchen bench, which is out on the patio. So whilst I'm going to give you an outline of how I make it and some demonstrations of the types of folds and stuff I'm doing and then some imagery to show you where you where it needs to be before you bake it and things like that which I found really helpful to see someone else's dough at the right point for when they stick it in the oven things like that so uh, I did all that footage to share with you but at the same time sourdough is one of those things that really requires adaptation to your location i've discussed this before i get a lot of questions about sourdough about doing starters and how i do my bread and everything else and i share lots of bits and pieces as i do it but i feel kind of wrong in giving tutorials on sourdough because it really really depends on your location your weather and all of that with sourdough, it is very, very much that you are reading the dough, not the clock. Uh, you have to be aware of what the dough looks like, what it feels like, what your ambient temperature is, how much starter you use and all that sort of thing, rather than just following a recipe. So I can give you the recipe of how I make my sourdough. It's not going to work for everyone. Uh, the ideal temperatures for it to proof in, like a, so an overnight proof is sort of a, 17 to 21 ish degrees celsius uh, and the initial proof that you probably don't want it any more than sort of 28 uh, except that it's been 35 to 40 during the day here so some of my daytime proofs have have completely blown or the dough is so warm that you can't do any sort of structured coiling folding stretching anything like that until it's been refrigerated because it's too warm so there's this there's so many other aspects to sourdough and bread making that are more than just giving you a recipe and showing you how i make it so maybe we need to do some sort of a series on flops and and successes and differentiating differentials on the temperature and it, it'd just be a little complicated to put together, I think, because I'd need to film the sourdough stuff over a couple of weeks and show you what happened in different situations for different weather and then collate it in a way that makes sense. I'll have a look at it. I'm getting better at doing that with the what we eat in a week videos by taking footage of every day, every day's stuff and then collating it in one. But it's not something that I'm super successful at. I have... I have very limited tools. Uh, I only have one SD card. Uh, my external hard drive fills up each month. I have to delete the month 
prior because it's just not large enough to deal with the quantity of videos that I'm putting out uh, and things like that. So uh, my resources are a little limited in that sense and I just can't afford to do anything about it at the moment. So uh, holding on to footage for a period of time becomes difficult and collating it. But I am getting better at it So and I'm getting better at deleting a couple of months back so that I've got room for the newer stuff. So I will work on it. But ask any questions or give some suggestions and stuff in the bottom because I do get asked a lot about how I do my sourdough and about getting the starter going and reading the starter, reading the dough and things like that. And I would love to explain it. I'm just not so sure that I see a lot of YouTube tutorials on sourdough and what works for that person isn't necessarily going to work for everyone because it really varies. Uh, there's things like altering the starter in your recipe uh, you can use a small amount of starter or a larger amount of starter so in winter I tend to use a larger amount of starter because the temperature is lower so it gives more lift to the dough in, in the period, same period of time that in summer I would reduce the starter because otherwise it will overproof in the same amount of time so there's all those sorts of aspects that are to do with it and then if you increase or reduce your starter then you need to increase and reduce the um, flour and water ratios as well because otherwise you're changing the hydration of your dough too. So whilst it sounds complicated it really isn't once you just start taking notice of the dough and I to be honest when it comes to sourdough the thing is make it. Keep on making it. Even flops can be used so even if you end up with like a hard discus of a loaf grind it up for breadcrumbs. Sourdough breadcrumbs are delicious. They're awesome. So you know it, it's not it's not a, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not a simple thing, but it's not a complicated thing either. It's something that you have to do and learn in your environment, your starter, everyone's starter is different as well. Uh, my starter that I'm currently using will go from nothing to tripled within two hours in my weather of an afternoon at the moment. Uh, some people take six hours, things like that. I store my starter in the fridge. Uh, so I let it double and then I put it in the fridge and I use it straight out of the fridge because our weather is appropriate. In winter, I don't put it in the fridge because it gets down to zero overnight. So it's basically like being fridged. Um, I run two large pots of starter because I like to have a backup in case something happens to a jar, which something happened recently. One of the jars got knocked over and it went all over the bench. So I was glad to have the second starter. I also have some dehydrated starter as well. Uh, I did think too, I could dehydrate a bunch of it. And uh, if people wanted some of my starter too, I could dehydrate it and gift it, sell it, whatever. Um, so that you've got a nice strong starter to start with. So uh, I rehydrate my starter. I don't use it as a dehydrated powder. I use it to start a new starter if I have lost my old starter. Um, so I could provide you with, I don't know, 10, 10, 20 grams of dehydrated starter, and then you can start a new starter from that, but it has the strength of my starter. But every starter is slightly different because it's made from wild yeast. It's made from ambient uh, yeasts and bacteria. So my where my location is creates my starter. But if you took my starter to somewhere else, it would become a different starter because it's using the bacteria and, the, and everything in your, and the yeasts, wild yeasts and that in your environment as well. So there's just so many variations in sourdough. And honestly, the, the big thing for me is just do it over and over again. Make mistakes, make, uh, take note of what works and what doesn't for you. Uh, take note of what temperature is gonna be, when you want to eat it and things like that. Uh, I use a lot of long fridge retards because that means that I can make the dough up, stick it in the fridge and not have to cook it for 36, 72 hours, depending on what's going on. Uh, and things like that. So anyway, this intro has gone on well and truly a significant amount of time, but I'm gonna run through how I made this sourdough focaccia because it was, it's brilliant. I've made it four or five times now. It is really thin and crispy on the top and the bottom. The inside of it is almost like a croissant. It has these rippling layers of almost pastry-like bread uh, and it has been divine. So I'm gonna show you how I did that one and the little bit of extra 
hands-on time that I put into it to accomplish what I did because I have made focaccias before but they've been a little heavy a little dense they just haven't been quite exactly what I wanted so I sort of walked away from it because there was other choices but this has been wonderful and it is requested heavily so enjoy watching ask any and all questions have some comments or some feedback in the comments and we can see what we can work on to do with the sourdough I always think there's just so many sourdough videos out there and people who've been doing it for a long time and why would you need something from me but I'm happy to do it regardless. So I will show you this one and then I will see you on the next video. Thanks guys. Okay, so one of the first things that I do differently with the focaccia is that I have it, I start it in a nice wide bowl because I'm gonna be a bit more hands-on with this dough. So I want something with some nice wide uh, space for me to work the dough in. I have these gorgeous bowls i'm not even sure where they came from i have two that are very similar with these beautiful glazed patterns and i'm really glad that i found this as a use for them i used to put eggs and stuff in them just because i wanted to use them but they work really wonderfully for the bread so it's a fairly high hydration dough as most focaccias are because you don't have to shape it so you the higher the hydration the sloppier the dough and the harder it is to work with so because you don't have to shape a focaccia you can have it really nice and high hydration which gives it those lovely bubbling layers in the dough but you don't have to handle it so it makes it easier so it's a fairly high hydration dough uh, I'll put the ratios in the comments i will try uh, i don't have my notebook with me where i am but i will i will try <laughs> uh, so it starts off with about uh, 440 grams of water and then it has 100 grams of starter so this is another thing where if the weather's too warm i would reduce this starter amount because 100 grams of starter to 440 grams of water is a fairly high ratio so you could drop that to 50 grams but if you did that you would have to reduce your water by 25 grams and reduce your flour by 25 grams so you have to keep that in mind so we'd start with 100 grams of starter and I just mixed that through the water uh, then you add your flour so we are doing around about 525 grams of flour but again this is going to vary so I am using the flour from Costco the baker's flour from Costco and it is a fairly good flour but not as high quality and depending on the type of flour you use depends on how much water it sucks up so sometimes I need to add a little more flour or a little less water with the Costco flour because of the quality of the flour the higher the quantity the higher the quality of flour the less you have to adjust that so we do around about 525 grams of bread flour but it would go up to about 540 depending on the texture of it and that's again something that you have to figure out as you go along the texture of the dough alters depending on the flour that you're using and the temperature and you have to read it and decide what you want to do the most so the recipe is about 440 grams of water 100 grams of starter and 525 grams of bread flour but again we're discussing this whole fact that sourdough is so variable that it makes it hard uh, i add 20 grams of olive oil and 20 grams of honey to that as well now the other thing here is that because it has some honey or you could use sugar or whatever in it because it has some of those extra sugars in there it is going to create more fermentation more quickly so by adding that you have to be aware that that's what's going to happen and because it's a focaccia that's not necessarily a bad thing because as i said we're going to be basically overproving it because you want it really really bubbly because you don't have to shape it and handle it so I put all that in the bowl and then I bring it together. So all I want to do is hydrate all of that flour. You just want to mix it all up into a shaggy mess and make sure that all the dry bits of flour are combined. Uh, you don't have to worry about the texture of it or anything else to start with. It will change immeasurably in the first half an hour. So I just bring it all together and then I cover it. I have some of these disposable shower caps that I bought on eBay they're really cheap I can get a couple of uses out of them and they work really well for me I would like to uh, make myself some maybe maybe I need to do some beeswax wraps but then put some elastic on them I'm not sure how well that would work though but you want you don't want something too breathable because the dough can dry out so plastic works really well so uh, maybe I need to find some higher end uh, shower caps that will last me more than just a couple of uses but anyway squirreling a little bit there 
So once you've left it for half an hour, as you can see, the texture of the dough is completely different. So what we're going to do is what's called a coil fold. And basically that is just pulling up as tall as you can go one direction and then spinning the bowl and doing it the other. However, this very first fold, it's still going to be pretty sloppy and not have much structure to it. So you tend to do more of a stretch and fold movement and bring all the edges in so that you're making sure that all the dough is in the center and the, the coil fold is a little less important. Uh, that's your first one after half an hour. Then half an hour later, you come back to it. And as you can see, the texture of it has changed again, a whole lot. Uh, it's starting to get more structure, but still not superb. So bring it all into the middle from the edges of the bowl to start with, uh, so that you've got the dough in the middle and then we're going to do the coil folds. So as you can see, you pick it up and you bring it up nice and high so that it all comes away from the bowl and you place it back down with those bottom bits tucked underneath it. And then you spin the bowl and you do it again on the other side. So you can do this a few times. It's, you can tell the texture of the dough each time you do it. Like that first time you pick it up, it still sticks to the bowl quite badly, but the second time it comes away. And then the third time it comes away even better. So, you know, do three or four of them until it feels like it's coming away from the bowl and you've got all the dough in the middle and it's working. It's sitting in the nice, a nice ball. Then you leave it again for half an hour and come back. So then each time you do this, the texture of the dough will change. And as you can see, the once you've done the coil folds, it has this real pillowy, puffy sort of a, a texture to it. Like it's sitting in the middle nicely. It's got a nice smooth uh, surface to it. And it just, it looks like a nice, clean, strong dough. And then once more, you can put, as you can see, I'm spraying my hands with oil here and you can, so that works quite well. You don't really want to use water because then you're introducing more hydration to the dough. Uh, so if you spray your hands with a little bit of oil, it does help. But the more times you do these folds, you'll see, see it's not even really sticking to my hands anymore because the structure of the dough from your coil folds and from the time of fermentation has completely changed the texture of it. So you do it that last time and it ends up in this lovely, clean looking ball in the middle of the bowl. What we do from that point is we stick it in the fridge. So the timing of this is going to be fairly variable. It really, there's no too much time in the fridge, not really. Uh, the However long you leave it in the fridge will depend on how long it needs to be left out afterwards. Uh, but I did this over sort of the afternoon while I was doing other food and then I put it in the fridge about dinner time So I had it out on the bench while I was doing all the prep food prep in the afternoon And then put it in the fridge once I started dinner prep so that uh, it was out of the way and it was sorted so sort of I don't know five or six o'clock in the afternoon it went into the the fridge and I had done four coil folds over half an hour in between so you know two or three hours of hands-on work then it went in the fridge at about five once it's been in the fridge for as long as you want to leave it so again we're going to be pulling it out of the fridge to leave it to prove overnight depends on your temperatures overnight as to how late you want to pull that out at, on a night where I'm only getting to 19.20, I can pull it out at sort of 10 and bake it at 6.37. Uh, but if it was, if it's too hot, the other night I stuck it in the fridge and I, it was still 28 degrees at 10 p.m., which was far too hot. The dough would never have been usable in the morning. So I actually left it in the fridge all night and I pulled it out of the fridge at 6 o'clock in the morning. And then a few hours later, then I baked it. So 
if your temperatures are sort of 19 to 21 overnight you can pull it out at sort of 10 p.m if you plan and bake, plan to bake it at sort of 6 6 30 so all you do is you pull the container out of the fridge and as you can see it's still gained a little bit of volume uh, and what you want to do is you want to put it in a baking tray to give it room so you're going to coil fold it one more time you can do this in the bowl before you get oil on it or you can do it in the in the tray with some oil on it it is a little bit more awkward in the tray with the oil in it i have found but at the same time i think it helps with the layers adding that oil into the layers of the coil fold so you just put it in the tray the tray has to be really well oiled as well put it into the tray and then you cover the tray and the tray sits on the bench or somewhere within that sort of 19 to 20 degrees overnight and then you just leave it alone so the next morning you get up and so this is what the dough looks like at around about the 6.30, 7 o'clock mark in the morning. So it's got this gorgeous bubbly texture to it. I obviously forgot to turn the camera in on when I dimpled it. So all I did was I oiled the top of it and then used my fingers and just pushed little holes in it. You can see all the finger divots all the way through it. Uh, so I just pushed my fingers all the way through the dough uh, just to even it back out all the bubbles and stuff so it's got these lovely bubbles with all the finger divots in it and I sprinkled it with flaked salt it goes into a hot oven so 225 ish for only about 25 to 30 minutes uh, and it then it's done that's it so I turn I come out when I make coffee at 6 37 o'clock in the morning turn the barbecue on and it, let it heat up while I make coffee and then stick it in there and walk away for 25 minutes come back and check it at about 25 minute mark if you want to check the internal temperature of the bread you want to aim for 99 ish celsius for the internals to be cooked to 10 fahrenheit i think it is and 99 celsius along around about that amount to tell you that the inside of the bread is cooked and then you remove it so once you've turned the oven off leave it for five or ten minutes and then put it out onto a rack so that you can keep that bottom nice and crispy i have experimented using baking paper or straight on the tray out of curiosity and it stays crispier straight on the baking tray it leaves it's a little bit more clean up but that's you know that's life so once you have it on the rack let it cool you should never cut bread while it's hot hot because it will go a little bit um, tacky in the middle with because of the steam so let it chill a little bit let it cool just a little bit before you slice it but of course you can eat it hot and it's always nice hot uh, one of the ways that we prefer to serve the focaccia is just with an oil dip so I have this lovely garlic grating plate that Nicole a friend of mine purchased for me and all I did was I grated up a clove of our homegrown garlic onto the grating plate added some rosemary from the garden a whole lot of olive oil this is the blended olive oil that we get from Costco which I really enjoy and then a drizzle of balsamic vinegar and that is how we like to dip this bread when we're doing it as a bit of a treat so once the bread is a bit cooler then you slice it I've got a little clip in here that so you can hear the sound of it Uh, because it's it's just a wonderful sort of a sound and then we just cut it into chunks and we dip it into that olive oil and eat it like that of course we eat it in a myriad of ways but this is one of our very favored ways of eating it we regularly cut it into like a big uh, cut it into pieces and cut it in half and use it as sandwich bread uh, i have been going to test out using one of my cookie sheets to cook the focaccia on it instead of one of the the cast iron baking trays thinking that slightly thinner would be better we'd get more sandwiches out of it if it was slightly thinner but i'm concerned the cast iron sort of it creates a good environment for that dough to cook in whereas the baking tray they're not very heavily lipped so i'm wondering if the dough would overflow a little bit though i don't think it would spread out to the whole tray i don't know uh, but it's also aluminium and we're cooking in a barbecue so i think it would have a risk of burning the bottom of it as well so i'm gonna have to experiment with that or maybe i make one and a half times the dough instead of double the dough and split it between two trays and so that it's a three quarters of each uh, batch of dough into the two trays instead of a full batch in each but anyway i'm going to experiment with that and that's just about me and my portion controlling and trying to extend what we eat and what we make to to best suit our family but otherwise it is a favorite 
bread of late uh, and it's worth the effort. And I'm in the kitchen anyway, so doing those extra coil folds for the few hours is really neither here nor there. I do need to get myself a new kitchen timer so I can just hit a button that'll beep at me every 30 minutes. Uh, and we did have some issues with it the other day. It was just so hot that I could not coil fold it because the dough was just, it was too hot. Uh, so I stuck it in the fridge and I did it, finished the process the next day. So that's doable as well. So I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you on the next video. Bye guys.